Scripture reading is Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed in with the sun, and a woman under his her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away the third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Amen. Emmanuel Choir Nisei Orchestra will glorify God with their praise. We will watch the senior pastor's video sermon entitled The 47th Lecture on Revelation. Loving brothers and sisters in Christ, the members of branch churches and local sanctuaries, all of the members who are attending this service through the Internet, and GCN viewers. Revelation chapter 12 represents many symbolical stories. First, uh, uh, let me briefly summarize them. The main characters are a woman and a dragon. When the woman was about to give birth to her son, the dragon tried to devour her child but failed. Her son was caught up to God, and the dragon was thrown down to the earth after the dragon was defeated in a war against Archangel Mikhail. After the dragon was thrown down to the earth, it tried to kill the woman and she fled from the dragon into the wilderness. The dragon poured water out of his mouth to kill her, but the earth drank up the water and helped the woman. Then the dragon was enraged and went out to make war with the rest of her children. This is the brief summary of the chapter 12 of Revelation. Some of you may say this chapter is like a scene from a sci-fi movie. However, the story of this chapter is not something out of imagination, but it's true and will be a reality. It is the story recounting the history of Israel from her past till now and into the future. Then, who is this woman? And who is the child she gave birth to? What does the dragon symbolize? If you heard the message of the cross, then chances are that you may already know the answer. The woman spiritually symbolizes Israel. The dragon is also called the serpent or the serpent of old. It refers to the enemy devil and Satan. Genesis 3.15 features the scene in which God curses the serpent which deceived Eve. It reads, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This verse carries a very important spiritual message. Here, the woman refers to Israel, her seed to Jesus the Savior, and the serpent to the enemy devil and Satan. Jesus, the seed of the woman Israel, bruised the serpent on the head, and the serpent bruised Jesus on the heel. This is the providence of the salvation of the cross. The enemy devil and Satan incited the evil people to crucify Jesus on the cross. This is the meaning of the serpents bruising the woman's seed on the heel. Then, the verse says that he shall bruise the serpent on the head. If you want to catch a snake, you must grab its head, not its body or tail. If you grab its body or tail, you may be beaten to death. You overpower the snake by holding its head. 
When you observe people who catch snakes, they use some kind of stick and hold its head. Then the snake becomes powerless and cannot even beat them. When it says the seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent on the head, it means Jesus will break the authority of the enemy devil and Satan. In other words, Jesus who died but resurrected will break their authority over death. Like this, the crucifixion and the providence of salvation were prophesied in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. If you know this spiritual secret and read tonight's scripture, you can interpret most of it. To that extent you have the spiritual knowledge, you can interpret the Bible by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's delve into the details of tonight's scripture. The verses 1 and 2 say, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. It says that a sign appeared in heaven. It means that everything that Apostle John saw is under the management of God. The sign here refers to wondrous works manifested by God in the Old Testament times. I've distinguished the Old Testament signs from the New Testament ones. But here appears an Old Testament sign in Revelation. There is a reason for this. In the Old Testament, signs refer to wondrous works manifested by God. On the other hand, signs in the New Testament refer to works of the Holy Spirit. The same word, signs, refer to either the works manifested by God or the works manifested by the Holy Spirit. This way, signs can be categorized into the works manifested by God and the works manifested by the Holy Spirit. By the way, a sign in tonight's scripture is a work that God Himself manifests. That is to say, things that unfold in the Revelation are manifested by God Himself, not by the Holy Spirit. It is a sign which is in the providence of God who cares for the people of Israel who are still bound to the faith of the Old Testament. The choosing of the people of Israel, the history of Israel under his guidance, and all the incidents that will take place through Israel during the seven-year Great Tribulation are all signs in the providence of God. Therefore, tonight's scripture can be viewed from both perspectives, the past and the future. In other words, both the works that have been done through Israel and the works that will be done through Israel are contained in tonight's scripture. First, a woman clothed with the sun appears. I already told you that the woman refers to Israel. This verse says that Israel is clothed with the sun. It signifies the glory that Israel receives as a chosen people of God. However, because the people of Israel was chosen by God, have uh, they only enjoyed the glory like the sun? Of course, being a chosen people of God is such a great glory. But you can see that Israel has received significant harm just because Israel was the chosen people. Therefore, when it says the woman clothed with the sun, it literally means she receives great glory, but at the same time, it spiritually means that she suffers from many afflictions and hardships. Why is that? Let me give you an illustration. Suppose uh, there is a CEO of a uh, conglomerate. 
but he doesn't have a successor. He is in a dilemma who will inherit his successful business. One day, he finds an employee who is to be his liking, but he cannot announce him as a successor right away. The employee must be qualified to become a successor. He must also be recognized and acknowledged as a successor by others. Therefore, from the moment this employee is designated as a successor, he must undergo very strict training, and he must be equipped with qualities to become a proper and appropriate successor. The people of Israel are the same. Since they were the chosen people of God, they have been through all the more righteous refinements and hardships. That's because they are the people who have to reveal the glory of God, and they were chosen to accomplish the providence of God. That's why you can see that they had to undergo countless afflictions and hardships throughout their history. In addition, the people of Israel will also suffer greatly during the seven-year Great Tribulation. When it says the woman clothed with the sun, it also contains this meaning as well. Brothers and sisters, the people of Israel are the chosen people of God, and the Messiah was born of them. The Savior, who is the light of salvation that is shining in the whole world, came from the line of Israel. What a great glory it is! In addition, the Bible is the history of the people of Israel, and it is also the textbook for our Christian life. Since they were chosen to play such an important role, they had to go through many afflictions and hardships. Chosen by God, there have been trials they had no other choice but to undergo. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of them underwent many trials. Even after the nation of Israel was established, they had to undergo trials. And they have become the example of human cultivation. For example, when the king and the people of Israel worshipped an idol, there there surely came plagues and disasters upon them. They were invaded by other countries, rebellions arose, or there were famines in the land. However, when they repented and turned back, God again extended His mercy. This cycle repeated innumerably throughout the history of Israel. In order to accomplish the will of God contained in human cultivation, the people of Israel were used as instruments. They had to undergo the processes of trials countless times because they are the chosen people of God and they had no choice but to become the example of human cultivation. They had to undergo such processes. For this, it says the woman is clothed with the sun. Now, the same principle applies to those who believe in the Lord. You don't just receive blessing and live in peace unconditionally just because you believe in God. Only when you are properly qualified as a child of God can you receive the blessings as God's child. For example, you must cast off evil to the extent that your faith grows while believing in the Lord. However, if you don't cast off sins but compromise with the world while confessing that you believe, Satan will bring accusations against you. In that case, God cannot help you out. You will be handed over to Satan according to the spiritual law of justice. As a result, you suffer from afflictions and hardships that the enemy devil and Satan brings on you. Since you became a child of God, you suffer from afflictions according to that justice. Suffering from these afflictions, however, proves that you are walking down the path of God's child. If nothing happens to you, even after you commit works of flesh that lead to death, you are illegitimate children, as said in Hebrews. Namely, the Bible says you are not sons and daughters of God, because illegitimate children have nothing to do with God. He just leaves you unattended. 
But if you are children of God, retributions certainly follow as a result. They come in forms of trials or tribulations. Through this, God lets you repent and reach salvation. Without this, you won't even repent. You won't even repent, but eventually go down the path of death. Hebrews 12, 8 says, But if you are without discipline, of which you all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. That is to say, if you are truly God's sons and daughters, you will surely be disciplined. If you sin, there will be discipline as the price of sin. If there is no affliction or hardship, even though you commit sin or walk the way of death, you cannot realize it and turn back from it. Since God considers you His child, you suffer from afflictions or hardships. So when you live in the darkness, God intervenes for you and permits discipline, afflictions, or hardships so that you can realize and turn back from the sin. Chances are that some people in the world don't suffer from any afflictions although they live amidst great sins. But their result is surely eternal death. Discipline at least causes them to find things to repent. It makes them earnestly look for things to repent and rend their hearts in repentance. But without discipline, they will neither look for things to repent nor rend their hearts in repentance. Once their souls leave, they'll end up in death. On the other hand, if they are the children of God, there must be a proof that God intervenes for them. Sometimes they suffer from afflictions and hardships. When they repent and turn back, the grace is restored. Therefore, since you must undergo these processes as your faith grows, don't say it's difficult to undergo them. After passing through these processes and reaching a certain level, you will no longer suffer from them. The time comes when afflictions, hardships, and trials are over. Just think of Abraham. After his passing the final test, he only received blessings without any more trials. The purpose of refinement is to cast off even the evil in your heart and become God's child who resembles God. Therefore, once you commit, come into spirit and become a true child of God, since you don't commit sin any longer, there's no reason for you to suffer from any afflictions or hardships. In addition, you don't need to receive refinements to get rid of sins. Of course, there may be refinements to make you a greater vessel. They are, however, not tough and hard sufferings. Because you've stood on the rock of faith and your faith has become strengthened enough, you are able to pass any refinements with Amen. Therefore, I urge you to obey and practice the word and thereby come into spirit quickly. I pray in the name of the Lord that you will not suffer from afflictions or hardships, but that you will receive only blessings. If you successfully endure such afflictions or hardships given by God, blessings will follow without fail. Not only does your spirit and soul prosper, but blessings will come. Brothers and sisters, the woman clothed with the sun also implies the afflictions that Israel will suffer from during the uh, seven-year Great Tribulation. Even though the Messiah was born of the people of Israel, they themselves didn't accept Jesus as their Savior. Eventually, they will not be able to participate in the second advent of the Lord, but will fall into the seven-year Great Tribulation. They will suffer from many persecutions and tribulations. The woman Israel, clothed with the sun, is the expression of all these things. Next, it says, The moon under his feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Under her feet refers to the earth that the woman stands on, which is the land that the people of Israel live on. The sun shines during the day. However, the moon receives the light from the sun and reflects the light. 
The light of the moon is weak when compared with the sun. Therefore, the moon refers to the darkness of this world. When it says the moon under his, her feet, it has two meanings. First, it means that Israel has shown the light of salvation to the whole world in the providence of God. Just as the sh- moon shines with the light that the moon receives from the sun, the light of salvation was shown upon the world through Israel. The Savior was born in Israel, and the providence of salvation was preached to the whole world through Israel. Secondly, it means that during the seven-year Great Tribulation, there is only the dim light, like the moonlight and the darkness, unlike the bright light of the sun. There remains a glimmer of hope in God's grace by which they can be barely saved. Likewise, the spiritually dark and miserable situation is compared to the dim light of the moon. Now, when it says on her head a crown of 12 stars, it means that Israel prospered from its 12 tribes. Verse 2 says, She was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Just as in verse 1, this verse has two meanings as well. First, all the afflictions that Israel suffered up until the Savior came are described as the pain of labor. Before Jesus came to this earth, Israel was under spiritual darkness for hundreds of years. Israel was under the oppression of Gentiles, and the revelation of God discontinued. It was such a painful period. Secondly, all the afflictions that Israel will suffer during the seven-year Great Tribulation are described as the pain of labor. Israel ostracized the Savior who was born of its people and forsook the will of God. In return, they can receive salvation only when they suffer from great pain during the seven-year Great Tribulation, just like the pain of childbirth. They refer to all the persecutions that they have to suffer from through the Antichrist and that they have to suffer from in order to reach salvation. Another sign appears in the verses 3 and 4. It says, A great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. As I explained earlier, the dragon refers to the enemy devil and Satan, which betray and stand against God. And a great red dragon refers to Lucifer, the head of the evil spirits. The color red refers to sin and evil. Isaiah 1.18 says, Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Sins are compared to the color red in this verse as well. Now the dragon has seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. When the verse says that it has heads of seven, which is a perfect number, it means Lucifer is the leader in charge of evil. Ten horns refer to kings. They are the kings that are under the control of Lucifer at the end time. When these are connected to the seven-year Great Tribulation, the Great Red Dragon refers to the Antichrist. 
I explained that the force of the Antichrist would unite the nations of Europe. And there are seven nations which will lead the others in terms of politics, economy, and military. The seven heads refer to these seven nations. In addition, the ten horns refer to other ten nations which will support the seven nations. When it says on his heads were seven diadems, it means they have authority. The forces of the Antichrist enjoy the authority of the darkness during the seven year great tribulation. They enjoy the absolute power of the darkness that controls this world. For this, it says that there are seven diadems on their heads. Now, the verse 4 says, Kiss the dragon's tail swept away the third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. This verse also contains several meanings. First, it contains the rebellion that took place in the very beginning. Lucifer plotted to rebel against God and enticed one-third of all angels. With Lucifer as the central figure, the angels that belonged to the Lucifer rebelled together with her and changed into the force of darkness. The verse indicates this incident by saying, His tail swept away the third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. In the book, The Message of the Cross, I explained about the angels comparing to the robots that have no free will. But someone who was translating this book inquired about it, saying, angels do have free will, but how can they be compared to robots? They claimed that the Bible says angels have free will, but there are no such words in the Bible. But his question was, without free will, how could one-third of all angels have betrayed God? So he thinks they have free will. But it's not that they betrayed God out of their free will. It is the same with soldiers in the military. Depending on who the commander is, the soldiers act obeying his commands. In the Korean history as well, Such things happened a lot. When a divisional commander mobilizes the forces, the soldiers have no choice. Suppose the commander is a two-star general, then those under his command obey, obey regardless of their will. The same goes for any military units. If the commander rebels, the soldiers under his command absolutely obey. Otherwise, they may be shot to death on the spot. So to speak, they have no free will but obey unconditionally. So do they have any angels? Because one-third of all angels were placed under Lucifer's command when she betrayed, it's only natural that all these angels followed her. So it's not that they betrayed with their own free will. So it says, His tail swept away the third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Secondly, it refers to the wars which will break out during the seven-year Great Tribulation under the control of the enemy devil and Satan. The stars refer to all the scientific civilizations that have been developed throughout the history of mankind. There have been technologies that are beneficial to mankind. However, there are others that that may lead the mankind to destruction. During the seven-year Great Tribulation, the enemy devil and Satan make use of these modern conveniences, technologies, which will lead to destruction. and they drive the world into wars and calamities. This situation is described in the verse saying, His tail swept away the third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Some may ask, how, how come Lucifer betrayed as an archangel who didn't have free will? Among all angels, there were three archangels who were given human hearts by God. 
The three archangels were Lucifer, Lucille, and Lucia. God gave human hearts to them. They were bestowed upon free will so that they could choose to love or betray God. Lucifer was the archangel in charge of praising God, but she became so arrogant in her own free will. Her heart grew so arrogant to the point where she stood against God. There were four dragons that stayed closest to God and got involved in Lucifer's rebellion. These four dragons were dearly loved by God, staying closest to God. And you know how beautiful they were. Unlike now, before they were cursed, they had golden fur. Their fur was golden colored and brilliantly shown. So God would part the four dragons on their body like this. So when Lucifer betrayed God, she had to tempt those who were around God. If someone betrayed a king, he would have to tempt the king's ass- King's aides. Depending on whom he tempts, his plan may succeed or fail. For example, he may try to win over to his side the king's uh, eunuch or aides who stay closest to the king. Lucifer became so arrogant. She was in charge of praising God. You know, our God delights in our praise. As she grew so arrogant, she wanted to be like God. So she tempted the dragons who were around God, and they were deceived into joining Lucifer into rebellion. And one third of the angel under Lucifer's command had no choice but to follow her. And consequently, they ended up being forsaken by God and locked up in the abyss. Thirdly, it means that countless people will suffer during the seven-year Great Tribulation. God made a promise to Abraham that his descendants would be as many as stars. Here, the stars refer to people. Therefore, when it says his tail swept away the third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, it means one-third of the people will directly serve the Antichrist. And at the same time, it also means that countless people will be persecuted and killed by those people. Now, the latter half of the verse 4 says, And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. It refers to the situation when the enemy devil and Satan persecuted Jesus and tempted to kill him. As I said earlier, God already prophesied about the Savior in Genesis. The enemy devil also knew about this. It is written that the seed of a woman will destroy the authority of the enemy devil and Satan. And the enemy devil and Satan also knew that. For this reason, throughout the history of Israel, whenever the people of God appeared, the enemy devil and Satan tried all means to kill them. If someone performed power which comes from God, the enemy devil tried to try all kinds of methods to kill him, suspecting that he might have come as the king of Israel or the savior. The enemy devil tried to slay him. That's because they thought their authority would last forever if they killed the seed of a woman. It was the secret of God hidden since before time began, as said in 1 Corinthians. That's why many prophets were persecuted and killed by the hands of evil people. Even when Jesus was born, the enemy devil and Satan motivated Herod the king to kill Jesus. Even when Jesus was just a newborn, it tried to kill him by the hands of Herod, who was the man of the highest power, to ensure that he wouldn't make a mistake, he killed all male children from two years old and under. This is an obvious historical fact. 
The baby Jesus was able to flee to Egypt by the work of God. If you go on a pilgrimage trip to Egypt, you'll find the very spot where Jesus took refuge and also the church of Abu s u r g a set up there. However, the enemy devil and Satan looked for a chance to kill the seed of a woman, and finally they crucified Jesus on the cross. But it was as if they had signed their death warrants. Since they killed Jesus, the way of salvation was completed. and the way was open to escape from the death authority of the enemy devil and Satan and to reach salvation. And thus, the dragon's plan of killing the seed of the woman ended up a failure. Now, the second meaning of the latter half of the verse 4 is related with the end of the seven-year great tribulation. It means that the Antichrist tries to kill the people of Israel who accept the word. To prevent anyone in Israel from believing in the Lord, the Antichrist appeases people, tortures people, and persecutes people. The verse 4 describes this situation by saying, when she gave birth, he might devour her child. However, in verses 5 and 6, we find that the plan of the dragon failed. The verses indicate that there is a place prepared for Israel by God. Now, where is this place? How does Israel avoid the persecution of the Antichrist and reach salvation? We will look into this in the next lecture. If we take a look at the people of God who underwent great trials, most of them faced death. If you look at those who entered New Jerusalem, they went through experiences where they faced death for God or for the Lord. They faced experiences like martyrdom. So did Abraham. He had his wife taken away two times. As his nephew Lot was taken away, he saved him out of the battlefield at the risk of his life. Moses also underwent a 40-year trial, and his life was threatened by the Egyptian king. He faced such threatening incidents in order to fulfill the God-given tasks. Elijah as well. He was on the run, hitting himself from the king who tried to kill him. The same goes for Elijah, David, Daniel, Daniel's three friends, and Jeremiah. We can see that these people of God all went through the crisis of death once or more. Some ended up in martyrdom as well. They triumphed in all such trials by faith. It is also true of the people in the New Testament. Jesus' 12 disciples and the Apostle Paul, most of them became martyrs. Such was the case with John the Baptist and our Lord as well. After they won victory by faith in such great trials where they had to offer even their lives, God called them, My beloved Son, whom I am pleased with. If one becomes God's child whom God is pleased with, this means that he's got qualifications to enter New Jerusalem. One who pleases God has been qualified for New Jerusalem. But if he is just called my beloved son, he's been qualified for the third kingdom of heaven. In addition to being beloved, if he pleases God, that means he's been qualified to enter New Jerusalem. Our God calls our Lord my beloved one whom I am well pleased with. Let me conclude the message. Loving members, both in the past and today, the enemy devil and Satan still move the forces of the world to persecute and kill the people of God. Jesus also suffered from such persecutions and afflictions, and eventually he was crucified on the cross. 
he, Jesus was not killed because he has no power. He gave up his all in order to accomplish God's providence. By giving up his own life, he opened the door of salvation for mankind in the justice. The same applies to these days in accomplishing the providence of God. It's not always true that things are going well when they are done quickly. When they appear to be persecuted and delayed, it is the process of fulfilling the justice. Only when the level of goodness and the measure of faith are satisfied is God revealed in great glory. Even though Jesus died, He broke the authority over death, and He came back to life in the glory of the resurrection. You have experienced that even though we sinned dead, we later came out in the greater glory of the resurrection, haven't you? May you always experience such glory and blessing of resurrection in your life. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Let's pray thinking over the message. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Let's receive the prayer for the sake of the senior pastor through video. Please lay your hands on your sick heart or on your chest for the desire of your heart and receive the prayer with faith. Hallelujah, Almighty God, our loving Father. Please lay your hands on all believers who are receiving this prayer now. Show your works that transcend time and space on those who are receiving this prayer through GCN, Internet, and Satellite TV in branch churches and local sanctuaries and all other children of God around the world. Give them the faith to believe from heart to drive away negative thoughts and doubts and drive away all tests and trials. From head to toe, all in chairs, joints, nerves, tissues, and cells, or whatever the sick part may be, burn them with the fire of the Holy Spirit and the original light. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, germs, and viruses, and infirmities go away, life come. Please scorch all their terminal and incurable diseases with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Drive away all endemic diseases, including malaria. All contagious diseases, including cold, flu, and fever, go away. Protect them from all kinds of germs and viruses. Heal them of all stomach, lung, liver, breast, uterine, and intestinal cancers, AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, high and low blood pressure, diabetes, thyroid problem, and heart, lung, and women's diseases, and all inflammations go away. Heal them of polio, stroke, arthritis, and herniated discs. Back pain, headache, nausea, and all other pains disappear. Epilepsy, autism, depression, neuroses, and other mental diseases go away. All kinds of paralysis be loosened, get up, walk, and leap. Let the eye see well, let the ear tell well. Let the blind come to see, the deaf to hear, and the mute to speak. Heal them of after effects of all kinds of accidents. Fix their broken bones. Restore them from burns. Let the heat and burning sensation go away. Father, let there be no scar left. Be cleansed from all kinds of drug addictions, poisoning, and substance abuse. Let the dead nerves, tissues, and cells be regenerated to bring the dead back to life. Give them the blessings of conception. Receive the blessing of conception. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, the ruler of the power there, the evil forces of the heavenly places and their servants, go away. Go away, evil, unclean, force, and deceitful spirits, separating spirits, and all forces of darkness. Losing the bonds of wickedness, darkness, go away, like calm. Father God, give them strength to crowd in prayer and the power to cast up sins and become sanctified. As their souls prosper, let all things go well with them and let their families be evangelized. 
Protect them from all kinds of accidents and disasters throughout this week and bless them to lead a prosperous life without any problems. With the fiery words of the Holy Spirit, heavenly host and angels, and with your blazing eyes, protect all your children, their families, workplaces, and busy fields. Give students wisdom and understanding and give them enthusiasm and forward to study hard. Please keep their hearts and minds from worldly things and let them love God more fervently. Whether your children eat or drink or in whatever they do, let them do it all to live a life glorifying you, Father God. Let them be able to testify about the living God, saying, I've met and experienced God and received these answers and blessings. Father God, thank you. Be glorified alone. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.